Welcome to Digital Leaders TV, the live discussion show where we gather up a cluster of top experts to get to the bottom of some of the most important issues facing today's digital leaders. My name is Robin Knowles, and today we're talking about smart cities and securing innovative GovTech solutions. Now, in 1950, the population living in UK cities was 79%, already a large figure, but one which is set to rise to 92.2% of the UK population by 2030. The challenge to create urban areas where people, society and business can thrive in the next 10 years has never been more urgent. Now, digital transformation of these urban communities is necessary and is already underway from Belfast to Cardiff, London to Edinburgh. From urban infrastructure through tourism to healthcare services, there are endless opportunities for collaboration between the public sector and innovative enterprises and SMEs. So how does this happen in practice and cross, can cross city programs enable greater and faster ways for innovative tech to find its way into the public sector? There are two conferences that digital leaders will be attending in June that should put you in touch with this agenda. Firstly, on the 20th of June, during the 14th National Digital Conference is called Smart Places. And the following week, there's a two day conference and expo on the 25th and 26th of June to Solutions Expo, hosted at Excel, also in London. Now, today we've brought together four of those taking part in those conferences and who are leading smart city thinking and transformation. So I'm going to introduce our guests one at a time uh, so we can hear a bit about what they're doing before we begin a discussion and I ask them some questions. So I'm going to come to Raj Mack, Head of Digital Birmingham first. Raj is leading Birmingham City's smart city agenda and is developing and delivering collaborative digital projects and activities that will ensure that the city and the wider region have the right digital infrastructure that people need. Raj, welcome. Hello, how are you? I'm really well. Tell us what's going on in Birmingham. Well, Burma is quite an exciting place at the moment. Um, there is many, many different things happening here at the moment. Uh, as you know, Birmingham really embraced the smart city agenda. And I think we were one of the first uh, adopters of the whole principle. I remember almost, what, 2012 when uh, we introduced the smart city agenda to our senior management, who all looked at us quite skeptically and thinking, you know, what's, what does smart technologies actually mean? What is it? What's your definition? And to be fair, even at that stage, we were quite stumped as to what smart city actually meant. Other than what it really tried to convey for us was how do we use digital technologies? We've been embracing digital technologies. We've been talking about digital technologies for so long. And it was always trying to bring us to a point where digital technologies was in the marketplace. And by 2010, 2012, the city had created infrastructures. Digital technology was quite well adopted by both our citizens and in the business. And we thought, well, what does smart actually mean? And for us, it was about how do we make the technology work? How do we actually turn digital technologies into changing services? For us, SMART was about the catalyst, about bringing different services together, understanding how they integrate, and then bringing together a community of different people to understand how and what we can make and, and really where our focus was gonna be. And one of the things that we did as a city was really make sure that we understood what SMART would mean for us. So for us, it was about economic growth, having that vision that brought together the different parts of the council and different partners of the city together and say, well, what do we need to do and how do we work together to actually embrace it? And for us, as I say, we started the Smart City Agenda quite early on and we've worked with different partners, the BSI and stuff like that to help develop what the strategy, the policy should be. So we've done that stuff. But what we also managed to create at the time was a, a roadmap that set out what our different projects would be. And we shaped it in, a, in, in enabling infrastructure. So what's the, 
the physical infrastructure that we needed. And that's about the, the wires and the wireless stuff, but also key about data. We understood the value of data as part of driving our smart city proposals, but we also looked at the skills capabilities. And this wasn't just the, the normal digital inclusion skills. How do we make sure our citizens have better connectivity? How do they access services? This was about how businesses engage with the council, how businesses can help us transform the different types of services we present and how they can be part of helping us create the solution rather than presenting us with various solutions where we would obviously try and find a home for, but getting them involved at a real early stage. And the third strand was about the innovation side. And we did many, many projects around innovation. We're at the stage now where we have learned many lessons from there and we have rechanged, refocused uh, what our smart city approach could be. We've adopted an approach where we're going to make our principles at the center of it. And so data integration of systems and making sure it's citizen focused. Those are our principles around what we will do in the future around smart cities. So here in Birmingham, as I say, at the moment, the opportunity is huge. We have 5G. We've become the national pathfinder for 5G. There's a real opportunity to understand how that technology not only delivers the normal day-to-day -day services using 5G technologies, but how do we look to see how we integrate different types of applications and merge those, converge those together to get holistic changes to the way services are delivered. And that could be linking social care with public health, linking it with the uh, health type of facilities, but also issues and opportunities within the community. So there's whole aspects happening around there. And we were lucky that we have a a, a digital mayor, a mayor that is really embracing digital technologies. And through that process, Birmingham has had the opportunity to actually shape what our 5G proposals could look like for the city. But also on the tech side, what we have recognized is that our businesses play a huge role in how smart cities will be developed in the future. The innovation, the types of new proposals and the type of applications that are coming out are hugely supportive of the agenda moving forward and the reason some of those applications are really supportive is because what we're trying to do is create an environment where we are taking the challenges to the private sector we are getting them to understand where our pinch points are where we need to support so they can engage with us at a very early stage and start helping us shape and cope co-design some of the applications around this and and to support that what we've tried to do again working with the combined authority is look at how we pull together programs that support business growth so we worked with uh, the, the sort of gov tech environment and we worked with an organization called public to try and bring together an environment where we presented um our businesses, our entrepreneurs, our SMEs with different challenges around public service reform, around health, around mobility, and to trying to challenge them to try and develop new types of applications that support them. So as an authority, we are doing many different things. The opportunities presented to us are probably the biggest set of opportunities we've ever had with the Commonwealth Games coming to Birmingham now. There's a real opportunity to see how we embed smart city thinking into the infrastructure. How do we make sure that our lampposts are enabled, making sure that we have an environment that we can put electrical vehicles and autonomous vehicles to the processes and it's embedded within the organization. So those those type of things are happening. We've certainly got HS2 and we've been working quite closely with HS2 to understand how we can look to see how digital technology and smart technologies will impact on the journeys, not just on the way the tracks are designed or the way the train is going to operate, but that journey to the station, away from the station. How do we use those technologies to engage with the citizens and ensure they have a really good experience? You, you remind us, Raj, that Birmingham is our second city and therefore huge and has a vast uh, array of options. So thank you very much for those opening words about all the things that are going on in Birmingham. So we're going to leave Birmingham in the Midlands now, head up the M6, uh, and we're arriving in Wigan. And our next guest is Sam Tilly, Program Manager, uh, IT Reform and Transformation Team, ICT Partnership, Custom Transformation. <laughs> a, long, a long job title, Sam, at Wigan Council. Welcome. Yeah, it's a very long job time. So. Um, but yeah, um, obviously, kind of in comparison to Birmingham, we're slightly smaller, but, you know, we're doing a lot of work here in relative um, to the Wigan deal. So we recognised, obviously, from our part that we, obviously, after being hit with a lot of the um, 
you know, the cuts that face us or we, we wanted to kind of obviously adopt the digital transformation methods and move forward in, in how we can best embrace this on a place-based approach. So we're looking at things like, um, you know, the impacts throughout, not just actually changing the individual operational services, but how we then make that wider to wrap the services around the place and the citizen. So, you know, here in my role in particular, kind of what that's involved is we have a, an a, the transformation through technology program, which kind of works alongside the services, establishing what the key enabling work streams are, are needed there. So part of that, like we say, is, is involved the back office and operational pieces, but then moving towards what that means in the place, whereas we've got um, a number of things going on, um, particularly in the health and social area where we're looking at opportunities from the locality place, which is how we can use the smart tech and the assistive tech to help us give that better, richer deal. So, it, you know, we're working with our locality partners, which include the NHS, the CCG, to bring together that wider offer. Um, so we're kind of building that up, which, you know, as we kind of go on and discuss, we'll, we'll kind of obviously cover those key challenges. Um, we do a number of things where we're working with GM partners, so as Wigan, we are part of Greater Manchester. So again, under the Greater Manchester hat, we're looking at how we can develop and offer a wider fibre rollout. So how we can get that fibre in all key areas and make sure we've, we've got that kind of trajectory and make sure everyone's got the available mechanism and infrastructure to get online and use the digital aspects. We've done a number of smaller line projects where kind of based on the environment aspect, we look at um, the use of the smart tech, um, for you know, waste management improvement, how we can better manage our highways, um, going into the winter maintenance and all those opportunities really. Um, there's a lot going on in Wigan. We're not quite as far on as Birmingham, but we're in the process now of really kind of embracing what opportunities are out and how we can build on what we already have to us. So we know we've got systems and we know we can get more out of this. So we're on that next step now, moving forward in how we can better broaden that out and get a better reach to the locality really. Brilliant. Brilliant. Thanks, Sam. Great opening thoughts from Wigan. Uh, now I'm just going to follow my theme of geography so that uh, th those of us who live in the south and who don't know the geography of the north can follow this on a map. So I'm leaving Wigan, I'm going north, I'm cutting across the Pennines, and I'm arriving in the northeast of England in Newcastle, uh, where we have Jenny Hartley, Director of Invest Newcastle. And prior to that, uh, you're at the City Council. Jenny, over to you. Yeah. Thanks. Hi, Robin. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, thank goodness you didn't mention, mention Trans Pennine Express, but otherwise I think we would have all got into a completely different subject matter. Um, so, hi, I'm Jen Hartley. I head up the Image Investment Agency for the City of Newcastle on Tyne, um, but I work very closely with the City Council and, in particular, the uh, digital uh, Newcastle team, which is all about. Um, transformation of the public sector um, and very much on the agenda is um, Newcastle uh, creating their smart city vision which they did so a few years ago. Now we purposefully try and um, avoid the term smart city in Newcastle mainly because I think a lot of our citizens and even businesses and I have to admit some uh, some of our officers don't quite understand what a smart city is or, or what that means so for us, the, the kind of the three main areas of our vision is are what we really focus on. Um, and those are improving the lives of our citizens, improving service operation and efficiency, particularly in light of uh, you know, budget cuts that are being, you know, that are affecting councils across the across the UK. Um, and finally to support economic growth, an area which um, being an inward investment director is is sort of key to, to my role. Um, in Newcastle, uh, we are a core UK city, but we are certainly not the size of, of uh, Birmingham or Manchester or even Leeds. So we have a small population, but a very rich demographic to work uh, to work with. Um, we've actually just um, appointed an innovation partner that's going to help us to be an intelligent customer. 
um, in terms of knowing how we can embed uh, innovative technical solutions uh, to actually meet the needs of our um, of our services and our citizens. Um, we're certainly not uh, trying to roll out technology for technology's sake, but we realise that task-driven approaches are uh, very well served by a lot of the new solutions that we're seeing on the market at the moment. Um, our innovation partner is hopefully going to help us to uh, cut through some of the challenges that procurement within public sector obviously um, rises as well. Um, so we're really, um, you know, trying to embed the culture of smart city thinking both within uh, the offices at the council, within the citizens, within the businesses that we have in the city. And a lot of that is around awareness building. So we've got a big campaign at the moment to uh, to really spell out, you know, what uh, these kind of changes to services and um, how they can uh, better the lives of our citizens. For us as a city, um, we are a, a very data-driven city. We um, are lucky enough to be home to the National Innovation Centre for Data um, and the Urban Observatory, which has the UK's largest number of real-time data sets. So what that means is basically we've got lots of sensors throughout the city that is testing everything from air quality to traffic management to how full the bins are and the overlapping of these data points are really to drive how we can um, better make decisions, how we can um, enable uh, the most efficient collection of waste or, um, you know, the, the, the switching on of lampposts and, and all of those day-to-day -day, um, ways in which the, you know, the city can run as well as it can do. Um, we're also um, really engaged in the sort of the ageing agenda and we want to make sure that that Newcastle is at the forefront of being a city that you can live longer, healthier lives. And that's a key part of our smart city strategy is to ensure that mobility and that social housing and that everything that you can imagine, health service, finances, um, is all um, done in the most intelligent way so that um, people can, you know, grow old without perhaps being a, a burden on council budgets in in certain in certain ways and um, so we're we're probably you know uh, just like uh, Wigan we're, we're maybe not as far ahead as some cities but we're certainly trying to to close those gaps and one of the ways that we're doing that um, as well as through the national innovation centers for data for aging um, and from creating a digital twin of the city so all of our sensors and all of the information that it provides are all mapped out on a digital system which is you know which is quite a, a, a clever piece of equipment to look look at we're also forming international partnerships as well so where our businesses and our individuals can learn off other areas and one of one of those partnerships is for example um with the uh, the uh, massachusetts institute of technology out in boston um, and their uh, age lab so we visited there back in december we've had uh, joint visits and there that we're working together to to sort of share learnings about how we can become a smart city and an age-friendly city as well, a multi-generational city. Um, so I'm sure we'll cover a lot more of that as we get into the discussion, but a little snapshot of, uh, of what Newcastle's doing at the moment. Cool. Uh, so following my geography of the United Kingdom, I'm now getting on the A1 and heading south. I'm arriving in God's Own County, uh, which gives you a hint of where I was born. Uh, and we're going to the fabulous city of York to Simon Brereton, who's head of economic growth at the city. Uh, Simon, how are things going in York? Uh, things are going great, thank you. It's a beautiful day here in York. Um, I would have come down on the train rather than coming down the A1, but um, uh, you know, we like uh, uh, to keep our links with Victorian smart city technology that York was so much at the forefront of. Um, yeah, things are going really interest, really well in, here in New York, and, and loads of opportunities on um, just over the, the horizon. Um, looking back on our um, journey so far in terms of smart cities, I think um, one of the key things for us is we haven't really. We are you know, York is, uh, as some of you will know, the UK's first gigabit city. Next year we'll have 
70 percent penetration of, of, of fiber to premise all premises in york which is a uh, a really interesting platform for how you do things and our focus has gone really into getting that infrastructure in place um and uh, making sure that citizens businesses and everyone else can take advantage of it rather than really thinking what do we do in terms of uh, smart city projects i think we look around the rest of the uk and see lots of pilots happening in places the real challenge is how do you do stuff at scale and that's the uh, that's the the step that we're trying to to overcome so we've um got some um really interesting smart transport projects that we're working on at the moment and uh with the aim to be uh, okay, we're the UK's first gigabit city. We want to be the UK's first um, connected and autonomous vehicle ready city as well and use that technology to enable us to do that. So um, working with industry really to set out the standards for, 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 for what we need to provide in terms of platforms to enable people to do that um, is it, the core part of, of, of what we're trying to do at the moment. So we have projects looking at you know, a lot of things that we're familiar with, looking at sensors and thinking about how we... Um, run traffic flows around our city, can, how we control the traffic lights to make sure that um, the jams are uh, minimised and people can get around the place, making sure that messaging gets out to enable people to take the best route to get into our city. Uh, now York was, um, well, was it ever designed as a city? I don't know. If it was designed, it was designed by the Romans. So it's certainly not really set up for getting around in cars, but you know, the reality is people need to get around in cars. So how do we, how do we, use the technology that we have to really enable those kind of things to happen. So I say a real emphasis on um, transport projects, and that's where the investment's going at the moment, um, but really all founded on how we got gigabit into York, which is an interesting story in itself, because you know, here we are about, I say about to have 70% penetration of fibre. We haven't actually spent a penny on that. Um, all we've done is taken our um, investments that we needed to make as a city in terms of our own IT network, um, uh, you know, and, and a council IT network, if you think about it, it's not just our office, it's the whole of the city. It connects up every school, every um, uh, every housing office, every um, uh, every lamppost to, 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 to that network. So when we were 10 years ago thinking, well, what should we do in terms of, of, of recommissioning our IT network? Um, we've gone, we've ended up with a cable network, which is then the, um, the backbone for a city-wide cable network that allows everyone to be connected. And suddenly that brings all sorts of other possibilities in terms of what we can do as a city. So beyond the transport things, we're looking at um, sensing in people's houses and thinking about humidity and temperature and CO2 and those kind of things that are really important in terms of uh, looking at the um, domestic environment, if you will. Um, and then on to that, beginning to look at things around uh, the whole social care agenda. But as I say, we're, our starting point is... Um, it, it is our cable network across the city and our transport projects at the moment. And so we start looking towards the future. Um, we have, uh, so if you come into York on the train, as I've just recommended, you'll end up right next to York Central, which is um, uh, a huge uh, brownfield regeneration site right in the middle of York. It's going to make a, an enormous impact to our city over the next 20, 30 years as it's developed. Um, and it's a, essentially an, a, a, a new city centre um, um, area because at the moment it's all railway sidings and that's all it's ever been. So as the roads are put out, as the buildings are put out, we can really make sure we get the infrastructure there in place. So when we're talking about York becoming the first connected and autonomous vehicle ready city, that's actually an area where that can really happen. Um, and then, so, but as well as our new neighbourhoods, we're also, York is a very popular test, tourist destination and, and, and lots of, uh, uh, Hugo did a poll last year on Britain's favourite city and guess what, York came top of it. That's the place that the people love to come to. Um, our city centre, as I say, is, was essentially laid out by the Romans and the Vikings and is no good for getting vehicles around. Um, we have to do a whole lot of things around anti-terrorism. In fact, we make, we've got to make it harder for people to get into a vehicle. So, how do we make sure that people um, with a disability can get into the um, city centre if they can actually drive into the city centre? Thinking about how we can use autonomous vehicles for that kind of last mile step into the city centre for people, and then also thinking beyond that into goods as well. So how do we use this smart city transport technology to really enable the future of, of, of York as a retail destination? Because um, uh, the, the, the changing retail landscape, and that's not really the topic for today's discussion, we could have hours to talk about that in, in itself. but um, 
because York is a very popular place for people to come to, we have a thriving retail scene here as well. We want to make sure that it stays like that. And we want to use our smart city technology to help um, ensure that, that that's the case. Brilliant. Well, thank you, Simon. So that's been um, four great uh, examples of smart cities and what they're doing uh, across the UK. So that's a great start. I've got some questions for you. Um, and what I'll do is I'll come to one of you kind of for an initial answer and then ask the, uh, the rest of you if you'd like to contribute, as I'm sure you will, to that, come, to that answer to chip in as well. So I'm going to start, I'm going to ask Jenny to start us off. And the question is, how important is the type of economy a city has? Does a smart city need to attract digital business? Jenny? Yeah, so from our point of view, I think for the very mindset of the city, it helps if there is a thriving digital community. And, you know, we've, we over the over the past few years, um, people have struggled to define what digital means because it's very rare now that you'll find a business, in fact, almost impossible, that you'll find a business that doesn't have an element of digital. So what we used to consider as digital were the traditional tech companies. So, you know, we've speak about Sage PLC um, or HP or Microsoft as a tech digital company. But in fact, you know, the more and more um, projects that I'm working with, it will be, a, you know, a, a magic circle legal firm, which is creating their tech R&D um, teams, uh, you know, and bringing those to Newcastle. So actually every company now has that, you know, that technology or that um, that skill set that it requires. So I think that actually, you know, the 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 way that a city um, leads with its kind of its knowledge economy, uh, shall we say, um, I think is important to to enable uh, local companies to get into the supply chain of actually uh, executing some of the the digital service transformation that we need and um, when it comes to citizens as well there is a real need um, for us to be able to upskill you know the the digital capabilities as well and you can imagine that from a council's point of view it's incredibly difficult to deal with the um, you know, very, very digitally savvy right down to, you know, to the, the a, a large base of the service users that perhaps don't want to, you know, that, that won't um, receive emails or, you know, God forbid you ask them to, to use an app for something. So there's got to be a very, you know, there's, there's got to be a very um, pragmatic approach to how, how we roll those services out. So in we have a we have Future Gov that has an in-house development team that sits within Newcastle City Council, and recently we've been using um, sort of AI and machine learning, like many councils have, um, to to sort of transform the way that we that we use our cert that we deliver our services, and we've had to you know make sure that we're very um, you know. Uh, sensitive to the types of platforms of the types of way that citizens will will actually want to use their services so we will use messaging that is already embedded on the majority of people's phones or you know we will slightly tweak uh, ways of doing things that will mean that it saves time from the officer's point of view but it's a uh, as user friendly like uh, Raj said before it has to be citizen focused you know both in terms of resources and the tasks that you're going to do that you're going to use um so uh yeah so i think going back to your question yeah i think it is important that um that the city is digitally you know aware and we've we've got the companies because at the end of the day you know we want to make sure that there is a local supply chain as well that is that is helping to inform and drive some of this change brilliant so i mean obviously the birmingham economy is very digital three universities um, very strongly founded, and also the Greater Manchester economy is very digital, uh, as we know, digital leaders, very uh, a very digital economy. So perhaps I can jump to Peter and say, you were saying the city is designed by Romans, full of tourists, uh, and consequently retail. Is your smart city underpinned by the local economy in any way? Is there, is there another side to York which you've not mentioned? Uh, yeah, we, we have two great universities here in York. Um, the University of York has got a really, really strong computer science department. In fact, there's really interesting research going on 
at the university really relevant relevant to to, to, to the autonomous vehicles that the, the Lloyds Foundation's charity uh, charity um, has got a research group looking at how on earth do you assure and insure autonomous vehicles which is an interesting question in itself that's that research is going on here in York so we have no, I think um, you know, Jen used the, uh, the, the the terminology economy. I think that's really important in this. It's you know it's not so much about how many smart city providers have you got. It's around what's the attitude of the place. What is the the uh, the kind of um, uh, the, the intellectual backbone of the place, and I, and how open are you as well? Is 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 almost more important than anything else there. So making sure that your data is open and that. Um, the, the kind of standards you're working to are standards that other people can adopt and engage are really important because business will go not to the city that's got the right slogan, they'll go to the city that's got the right opportunities, won't it? And that's, um, you know, so what do businesses want? They want customers um, and they want somewhere where they can sell their products and services and um, uh, York has a lot to offer in, in that aspect. We're, we're, we're a relatively small city um, but a compact place and somewhere that a lot, a lot of people know about and and and, uh, and care about as well. So, um, for uh, it, as we develop our, um, our our smart city solutions, they will be noticed by a lot of people, and and um, uh, they'll be the kind of things that people take away and think, "Well, I wish I'd, I had that in my place as well." So, I, I think, yeah. So, so, so what you need for, for, for to, to to really make smart city stuff work um, with the economy is, say, not slogans, it's actually the opportunities of making sure you've got the right mindset to, to, to do things. And really, to be honest, if, you, if, you, if you're not working in that way as a city, you're not really a modern city, even, never mind a, um, a, a potentially a smart city. Brilliant. So is being a smart city something that a council should lead? And I'm going to come to Sam for that. I mean, are there better leaders or it, does it require the council to pull the threads together? And I'm conscious that you're not all city councils or directly city councils talking to you. But Sam, in Wigan, is it the council that takes the lead? Is it collaboration, partnership? To unmute yourself. Sorry, yeah, no. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. I think there's the opportunity where kind oh. of... Sam, I... I can't hear you, so I'm going to come to Raj just while we sort sound out. Can you hear me? Yep, Raj, far Hi. away. Hi, yes. Um, it's a good question, and I think we have had a number of debates about this. In Birmingham, we do have a very, very active tech community. We have a lot of players in the market who all do do believe that technology and smart cities will make a, com a convincing change to the way the economy works. But in Birmingham, one of the things that we were really conscious of is to, to deliver a smart city, it, it needs to bring together different components of the city. We need to take a holistic approach to how different systems of the city work together. So this is about making sure that the leadership of that has that convening power, can bring in the private sector, can bring in the universities, can bring in all the different organizations, whether the SMEs, entrepreneurs, or the big organizations to get them to work together. And I think the local authority is primarily placed to be able to do that. I think it really struggles to do it from a, pub, uh, from a private sector organization because there is that aspect of the private sector is motivated in a different way they're an absolutely key component of what we need to deliver in the future, but their, but their ethos, their approach, and their motivation is slightly different than that of a public sector organization. I think having the public sector lead, giving and enabling our assets to be used, because that's the other key part the city plays in this. The city is rich in data, the city is rich in assets, it has 
all sorts of infrastructure that enables different parts of the organizations, different organizations to work together. And in particular, I think uh, if you look at the smart cities in its purest sense about having different partners working together and getting entrepreneurs to develop new applications that have a systemic change in the way people live their lives. Without that collaboration, well, that's like triple helix, a lot of often people say, coming together, you'll never be able to achieve that. And without having the public sector to do that, I think you'll always miss a trick. Great. Jenny, and then I'll, I'll come back to Sam, who hopefully will be, uh, her Sam will be back. So Jenny, any thoughts on that? Absolutely. No, I'd echo what Raj said. I think the public sector is definitely in a unique position because, well, basically we are custodians of many of the uh, physical and vir virtual assets of the city. So like Raj said, you know, the data points, you know, the ability to be able to open up large sources of data and to be able to um, to overlap those but the city councils can't do it alone um you know we are not known to be the innovators we need to um call upon our private sector um and academic partners so in newcastle we have you know steering groups that that come together and actually um, run through what the vision should be, what the the, the delivery should be for uh, true smart cities. We we work very closely with um, the universities. We we also have two, you know, we're a big university city, as most people know. For for Newcastle, you know, for a population of under three hundred thousand, we have fifty thousand students in the city. So it's a high proportion with Newcastle and Northumbria University, um, and they help to you know the computing science department, for example but Newcastle is you know is, is world leading and we um we definitely call upon their um expertise and their assets you know I mentioned the urban observatory um to help to uh, deliver our smart city um you know uh, deliverables and and we you know we we see particularly a, an area of the city um and the wider city we have a, a flagship site called helix which is a joint venture between newcastle university and uh, the city council and underwritten by large investment by uh, legal and general um which is a mixed use site of academia so the national innovation centers are there uh, the computing science department we have uh, commercial real estate we'll have residential homes and it's designed to be a living laboratory so it has its own energy systems on site and it has more sensors than um you know than anywhere else in the uk at the moment so we um yeah we, we definitely believe that the city council is the only ones that can really pull that together because nobody else has that kind of as, as much of the vested interest or ability to, to kind of thread it together as, as Raj said. Brilliant. Sam, are you back, back with us with sound? Can you hear me? We can. Welcome back. Good. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, again, just kind of further supporting um, what's already been said, you know, I agree that, you know, for me, the, the council plays a key part because obviously, you know, for ourselves, the citizens see us as a central point to come in. So, you know, as you've said, we can't do this on our own, but ultimately we know who our people are. So we understand the citizen and what those needs are. And again, it's about kind of rolling that out and getting the right partners and attracting those partners in and giving us some kind of innovative platform to work together at how we can get the, you know, a, a bigger, wider offer. So uh, I'm, you know, you, you've already mentioned that the big piece is about getting in, you know, like the universities, strengthening the use of their assets to help us build on that. But there's also, for me, an aspect of bringing in the community benefit. So, you know, we might be able to bring in, you know, smaller SMEs to allow them to kind of grow and kind of build on the economy and, and things within the area um, and, and kind of establish that real community piece as well. Because I know we've done a bit of work here already in Wigan where, um, we call it community book, but it, it's about working with a local partner to try and, again, using our expertise at knowing who the people are and what their needs are and, and kind of linking that through into them, allowing them to develop an app and a, a service that we, we can hopefully widen out and move forward. So, yeah, echoing the same, we, the councils, we are a key pivotal piece in this and 
getting our kind of knowledge and expertise of the citizen will allow us to widen that out. So that, that brings us on to, I guess, Hello, a just big piece of today's conversation, which is how does innovative technology find its way into public sector organisations? And that matters because I think, as Jenny said, you know, the, a lot of the infrastructure, the key elements, and Peter said it as well, sort of sit with the council. And yet, perhaps, compared to uh, an, an innovation centre at a university or some cutting-edge startup, uh, the council is not the most sort of digitally enabled, innovative organisation. And, of course, there's our lovely friend procurement to be taken into account. So I think Raj mentioned that the council had worked with public, who I know are in this space. I know that York, I think, has been involved with the GovTech Catalyst process um, uh, that GDS has been rolling out. And there's other great organizations uh, like CivTech in Scotland who are trying to uh, bring innovation into the public sector in kind of innovative new ways. So. Um, who wants to come back to me on that first? I'll jump in on that if you like. So um, I think the key thing really, well, from our perspective is, is, is around the standards that you're working to and around making sure that, as I say, you do things in an open way. So when we've been thinking about what might be able to deliver in terms of our smart transport projects, our starting point has been to sit down and workshop with a whole load of people from uh, from industry, how we might do that in a way that enables people to make best use of it. Um, we'll provide the infrastructure, but it needs to be infrastructure that actually works for everybody else. I think, um, you know, just thinking about what we were just talking about in terms of cities being um, leaders for smart, um, in terms of the smart city agenda, it's necessary but not sufficient for the council to be interested in. It has to do it in a way that actually opens the door to other people to come in and use it. Otherwise, you'll end up with a kind of proprietary transport, a council-wide system that isn't really much use to anyone else. So, set, uh, uh, yeah, we, 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 did, we, we did some workshops back in November for our Smart Cities project. Technology's already moved on in the last six months, so that a lot, whole load of that's almost out of date already. But you have to just keep engaging um, and keep making sure that um, you're doing things in a way that does enable people to get involved um, if you really want to make the most of this. So you, you make a really good point, Peter, which is that technology is not hanging about. So it really doesn't suit public sector, traditional public sector procurement route, particularly ones where you will develop a spec and then you go out to a, a tender process. And these tender processes can take up to a year and are potentially very unattractive to small businesses and startup businesses. So has anybody else been running a program that is uh, sort of tackling those challenges for bringing in small companies. Raj, do you want to come back on that? Yes, just to make sense. I mean, we have a, a very proactive uh, procurement team that's looking at how we can bring innovation into the public sector. And uh, I know my colleagues in procurement have been part of a, uh, a, a government uh, task force to try and introduce new ways of ensuring that we are bringing new innovation and creating the opportunities for SMEs and not just for the big organizations. And, and we've been doing small things to try and enable those, but also at the, both, so at the, both at the strategic level and at the operational level. At the strategic level, what we've tried to do is embed this in our policies and strategies. So we have our innovation strategy that ensures that we get practitioners to think about how we introduce innovation as part and parcel of any commissioning activities that we do. So that's built into that process. We've also established a, a digital platform, uh, find it in Birmingham, which creates and breaks down some of the projects so that we can provide opportunities for the small SMEs also to have an opportunity to bid for some of the contracts and that it provides us with the, uh, the transparency transparencies that everything we do goes onto this platform, whether it's a £5,000 project or a multi-million pound project, it provides that opportunity for everybody to and have an equal opportunity to play, uh, play in that space. But we've also worked with SMEs, for example, one of the things that we've done 
at the really early stage, um, as, as you, some of you may be aware, that uh, we are now bringing uh, Capita services, uh, our IT services, back in house. So we've had a, a, a long-standing partnership with Capita over the years, and they provide all IT. All that's coming back in house now. So the first of August, all those services will be transferred. And what we've tried to do is now break up those contracts. We've had open days, uh, information days, supplier days, where we've talked about the different types of services we want to provide, not just the IT services but also some of the smart city transformation i know some of the, my colleagues talked about uh, social care we talked about mobility how do we bring innovation into those type of things so what we've been doing is engaging with business at a very very early stage and say this is where we want to go this is what we want to achieve who wants to work with us so we've been capturing those organizations they've been emailing us with their information with their ideas so we're bringing those out together so what we will do is not saying we've selected you but we'll have that conversation with those organizations to understand where they fit in part of our huge supply chain so they could be a big organization but one of the things that we're doing is is asking for that supply chain to be created aligned to that we, we've introduced our, our social value contracts where we are encouraging local companies small companies to actually be part of that innovation part of that procurement so in through that social value policy that is encouraging innovation. It is encouraging small SMEs to be part of that, that process. The other ways we've been doing these type of things is getting the local authority to act as a test bed. Very often, um, small SMEs, entrepreneurs who don't have the three years accounts or don't have the financial credibility for us to procure the solution straight away, we've got them to be involved in doing a test bed with us. So we'll test their technology. We'll get our communities to test their community so that they can come back to us with the evidence to show how effective that can be. And I think the local authority is in a good place to be able to create that environment to have that test uh, capability for those new types applications so there are a number of things that we can do and we are doing the other ones are sort of small grants and, and birmingham is particularly uh, involved in a number of uh, initiatives like the sbri types of grants where we are pushing our challenges out at a very early stage encouraging smes entrepreneurs to be part of delivering that solution so they get involved at the co-design co-creation stage so that, and they will work with us right from the beginning to develop a solution whether it's around social care or around mobility to be as part of that solution creation so that when they get to a situation or a position where their solution can actually deliver the outcomes we're looking for they are there right away to actually be the person we procure the solution from. So there are a number of ways we are trying to push this agenda forward, but it's Brilliant. still early days. Okay, thanks, Raj. Jenny, any initiatives in Newcastle to bring smaller businesses into you know, what can be a very challenging environment? Yeah, definitely. I think I'd be lying if I said procurement isn't a challenge, but um, we have um, tried to streamline procurement services recently by employing um, a new procurement platform, which allows um, a, a quicker process and an easier process, so not reams and reams of, uh, of questions, etc., but using data to actually, you know, uncover that information. Um, we also, um, I think I mentioned earlier, Earlier that we've appointed an innovation partner um, who can help turn us into an intelligent customer so we know yeah. um, the types of products that we really should be looking for because like you say some of the products don't on on the market yet you know we are almost um, you know we're, we're kind of we, do, we don't want to go for just a a product that is that is you know usable but isn't um you know isn't designed um for, for the solution that we need it for um i mentioned also that we've got in-house teams now and uh, that in itself brings the challenge that um you know now that we are employing developers um we have to be seen as a an attractive employer for this hugely sought after skill base and we are you know actually one of our biggest competitors at the moment is um the dw or the HMRC that have digital hubs in the region and that are in themselves, you know, creating, um, you know, very exciting jobs for our graduates coming out of the universities. And um, we also run a number of um, challenges and hackathons, uh, which really, you know, will we'll state a, a problem and these um, 
smaller companies are able to respond to that problem and um, and to come up with the best solutions. So that there are a series of initiatives that we're rolling out at the moment, which hopefully makes it a lot easier for um, for smaller. Uh, local based companies to actually help to deliver the services that we need um, on a council level because we are one of the you know the biggest procurement um, you know organizations in the region so um, it only makes sense that we offer those opportunities to, to the companies here as well. Yes I guess the size of the economy and the importance of the council to the economy is definitely a factor in terms of tempting the private sector and innovators to get involved and I love your point you just made about in this fast-moving technology world, um, it's difficult to know what what's out there that you might want or what the possible solutions are. So, Sam, a final word from Wigan on this one, and then we'll we'll move on. Yeah, uh, I mean, can you hear me? Okay, just checking. Yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, we, we haven't kind of fully developed a full initiative because obviously at the stage where we are in our journey, but, you know, there's a lot of things and challenges that have come across, well, been presented to us on other things that we've done, which we know are going to impact us. So it's things we are kind of currently developing. You know, one of the projects, that, as I kind of touched on earlier, is we're, we're doing a lot of work in the health and social care area. And, and just recently, we're trying to kind of work on how we can develop and widen a a care offer out, including the care homes throughout the borough, um, whilst working with our, our partners. But, um, you know, we, we've started to do that and we're shaping that using like kind of consultation and virtual consultation elements. But that in itself is presenting us with a bit of how do we kind of, yes, we've done it in a, a, a smaller area, but it it's the scalability of that. So, you know, as we know with the traditional models from, um kind of getting some suppliers to come on board with us. It, I suppose there's a bit for us as well about, um, and I think everyone's touching on it, it, it's about that relationship with those suppliers, whether they are, you know, where I think the SME can give you a bit more of a, a kind of, um, I don't know, I'm going to say helpful, but with some of the larger companies, they tend to want to monopolise the solution and kind of just make you go down the route of everything has to be the kind of, you know, it's our kit or, you know, it's about getting the supplies to be kind of speaking with each other and, and coming to the table and, and looking at it with us in the procurement bit because everything is so fast paced and the challenge is to maintain the pace and keep moving forward. And if we get on board with the wrong supplier who wants to drive you down the line of it being the solution only with the tools, that causes us bigger problems. So for us, we, we're kind of recognising that all these challenges are things we need to look at. So it's about making sure we can get a procurement which allows us the flexibility of being more short term, how we can get the people to come in and kind of really get, um, you know, as Raj said, the test bed model of people coming in, getting quick fire wins and kind of demonstrating to us the power that that can bring to us and, and then how we seize those opportunities without then having to go back to the old school tender. So it's it, it's benchmarking, isn't it? And gathering the requirements and making sure that, you know, we've got very clear outcomes rather than a, a traditional um, kind of very regimented um, requirement structure. So to me, there's a lot of challenges for us and we don't have a, a single initiative that's currently addressing it. But as you guys are, and I'll probably lean on some of the learning from this is, this is our way forward so how do we overcome it and and who do we bring into the table to help us to do it brilliant thanks sam so look we are nearly i can't believe we're nearly out of time and our hour is up so we are running out of time but before we go i'd like to just ask our guests to each tell us for in about 60 seconds some closing thoughts or remarks uh, or to name an initiative they're particularly proud of that's going on in the city. Now, I'm going to do it in reverse order from where we introduced you. So I'm going to come to Simon first. Simon, I'm going to try. The floor is yours. Uh, thanks. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I've talked about some of our smart transport projects and our STEP programme is really at the heart of that. Um, we're immensely proud of the work that we're doing to, to try and make uh, York into the first city that's um, um, connected and autonomous vehicles ready. Um, and we are, uh, there's actually an opportunity for people to come and find out a bit more about that um, with a workshop we're holding next month at the National Railway Museum. So you can see some 
Victorian smart city technology alongside uh, all the latest um, technology there is here. It's really just for, for, for people in local authorities to explore all of that stuff we've just been talking about around procurement. So we want to share what we're, we're doing. We want to take everyone along, along on the journey. And we know that people are interested in what's happening here in York. So um, uh, look forward to hearing from you more and seeing you all um, in our great city. Brilliant. Thank you, Simon. And congratulations on becoming a, a gigabit city. So, Jenny, uh, in reverse order, I'm now in an electric car, having been told off for driving. Uh, <laughs> heading up to Newcastle. Jenny, final thought. Yeah, no, all good, all good electric cars up here. We make we make them just south um, in Sunderland. Um, yeah, Simon, I'll come down to York on the train. I, I love a good uh, journey down to the Railway Museum. <laughs> um, so I suppose from our point of view, yeah, from Newcastle, yeah, we are, we are pushing the smart city agenda. Like I mentioned, data and ageing are very much key themes of what how we're, how we're developing that. I suppose one thing I didn't get around to mentioning, which I'll get shot by someone if I don't, is... Um, is that we are also looking forward to welcoming um, the transatlantic cable. So I don't know too much about this, but basically a big uh, pipe that goes under the sea that connects us with Denmark and uh, uh, across to Blackpool and um, and uh, out to New York and Boston in 66 milliseconds, whatever that must, means. But apparently it's a, you know, high capacity fiber cable, which means that we will be um, an incredibly high, well connected um, city. So we're looking forward to welcoming that in um, and to driving more investment into the city through these means and making sure that, you know, like we spoke about to begin with, what we do is very much citizen focused. Brilliant. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, Sam and Wigan. Hi. So, for us, I think it is, I'm going to stress the health and social care work that we've had going on. Um, we, we've done a lot of work around the assistive tech area, and we recognise that there's a real opportunity to link into our Live Well strategy. So, you know, about kind of, um, again, Jenny, it's that age well element of it. In, getting people to kind of be uh, more comfortable in their own homes with the use of the people-powered tech. So we've done massive things where we've got a, a smart bungalow set up in Wigan where we showcase all the available kind of technology that we can offer um, to help support people onto their journey of better living. We've also got the exciting piece around linking in between um, ourselves and the wider locality offer. Um, which includes the hospitals and the other commissioning groups and providers and linking to care homes, how we can use and get a connected infrastructure that will allow us to supplement that using some of the learning we've already gathered from the um, smart tech area. So it's kind of making the use of those sensors and how we can use that to kind of feed into a virtual consultation to take some kind of um, impact off the um, you know, the acute services and then linking that back into kind of a citizen record and having a, you know, the link back and giving the data right to the other kind of adult social care teams, um, you know, community nurse areas and just giving them a wealth of information and data that is really going to help us, you know, really explore the hearts and minds of our citizens and give a much wider, richer um, personal offer to those individuals whilst also from our side making sure we've got the right information at the right time, giving the right care. So, Brilliant. Yeah. Thanks very much, Sam. And last but not least, Raj in Birmingham. I think I need a whole new hour to talk about some of the innovations we're doing. Not 60 but, seconds. Uh, <laughs> but I mean, in Birmingham, the beauty is we are doing all those different types of projects. We've got autonomous vehicles, we've got 5G, we've got a huge amount of work happening around social care and assistive technologies. But one of the things I will talk about is the work that we've done around data. And I think that's such an important area and how we see smart cities developing. We're leading a project called the Big Data Corridor. And that what it does, it, it builds on the open data opportunity open data portal but what it does it brings together both open data commercial data private data and also data held by private organizations that can bring their data onto this platform so it's a collaboration with the universities it's a collaboration with the smes and what we're doing is making that platform available with a sandbox capability where the different organizations can have access to all our different sets of layers commercial data, the stuff that we can make, but can they bring their own data onto the platform and play with our other data as well to see what we can create and what they can create and how they can change their models. And we've had some fabulous results from both the health sector, from mobility, education in terms of types of 
applications have been produced by these SMEs, which are now being embraced by the city council as a real opportunity to change that. And the two that I'll mention, which I think are fabulous, one working with the BBC and the health service, where we've used the data around sound from the BBC, which is supporting people with dementia and helping them to understand, bring back memories using the sounds and stuff, saying, yeah, this brings back really happy memories and it's 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 helping them to be happier and more content in their uh, environment. And there's others around school mobility, understanding how the data from schools, we've had the education department that kept all that data there quietly. We brought an SME in, they've shown them the value of their data, that they've pulled the data, and that what, what we're producing is a comprehensive approach for, for parents to understand how far the schools are, what kind of activities are happening around the schools, what other, other kind of capabilities they can have, and all that's happened because we've made our data available in a way that private sector organizations can access it. Fabulous. So I think we've proved that an hour is not enough. And I know we've literally scraped the surface of the smart cities and procurement agendas, but that is all we have time for today. Thanks to my wonderful guests, Raj, Sam, Jenny, and Simon for sharing their time and insights. And to you for watching. Uh, I hope you enjoyed watching Digital Leaders TV. Do join us on Twitter to carry on the conversation with the hashtag DigiLeaders. And do keep up to date about plans for Digital Leaders Week and the two smart city conferences taking place on the 20th of June and the 25th and 26th of June, respectively. So until next time, stay connected.